great. So how many of you have read this book, The Ghost in My Brain? This is an absolute must. I mean, you, there are a few books out there this, that's an absolute must. This is one of them. Um, a story of how concussions stole my life and how this new science of brain plasticity helped me get it back. Um, brain injury not only affects the physical being, but it has an impact on the soul's connection to the body. Uh, so he says that he was, um, at last, he was once human again after uh, having some therapy, vision therapy, that connected his brain. Really what, the, um, what Dr. Zielinski did was she looked at that idea of how do we get the brain to connect to all of our sensations? And she uses her auditory um, Z-Bell technique in her evaluation. She uses syntonics. She's created a program. And uh, she's one amazing gal. So um, great book to read, but understand that we really touch the person's soul. We really get them back again. Uh, I'm not sure if one of my videos has a story. I don't think I actually put it in. Mm -hmm. um, but one of, uh, recently, uh, I was going to play a video of one of our patients and just how he described how he doesn't feel connected to his own body. Like how he says, I'm physically here, but I feel like I'm there and I'm not connected and everything is disoriented and it's how hard it is to live your day. And then he goes on and he's like, there are some days, he said, this is going to sound really sad, but he says to himself, I only have to get through 20 more years of life. That's how he thinks of his day, is just another day closer to his death, which is still 20 years away, is what he's figuring. So we really need to make um, that connection with our families that we're uh, working with. So one of the things, and I think most of uh, the people in the audience here, most of you would agree, this traditional medical model, uh, it's good at acute care. So you have a brain injury, the traditional medical model will save your life. Uh, and that's, that's an important part. So obviously the work we do is also important, but when you're in the hospital and your skull's not put together, uh, you need to survive. So, you know, they're gonna save lives, preventing a serious condition from spiraling out of control, but what happens when the patient returns home? Okay, and that's really where we start to see a big disconnect in how these patients get better. Um, you know, neurologists know about primitive reflexes, but only when they're severe. So a coma, semi-coma, uh, cerebral palsy. Um, we've had a lot of patients, and even when we first started doing the reflex work in our office, families would then go run off to the uh, neurologist and say, well, I've been told I have a moral reflex, and I have, and the re neurologist would say, yeah, you do, but so what? You know, so again, it's not on their radar. They'll, you know, the tests for a moral reflex are a standard medical test. Um, and so, but they just don't know what it means that the reflex is active, what, what the repercussions are, and they have even less of an idea of what to do with it um, when it is active. So, you know, it's important to know um, that this perspective of the traditional medical model, um, and they really don't know about the successful interventions that, re, you know, how to reorganize the primitive reflexes. So, you know, we need to change this. And so we encourage families to go to the pediatric ophthalmologist and talk about the successes, go to the neurologist, go to the physiatrist, and then eventually those types of professionals will start referring when they see these um, positive outcomes. And one of the questions we like to ask is, what's your plan of care? When are you going back to the neurologist? When are you going back to your other providers? And then we write down those dates and when they're going back and then we have a little alert that pops up and we have conveniently set aside some brochures um, to say hey why don't you take uh, this to your doctor and let them know because there is nothing like a success case that's going to bring you more business so when that client goes back and they go wow you really did amazing. You're, you're different than all the other people that come back. What have you been doing? Well, I've been doing you know, vision training, been working on the reflexes, here's, here's where I've been, and you leave them some information. And you do that, get, if the doctor gets a few of those in their um, office, they're going to be sending, they're going to be driving people in their cars directly to your office and dropping them off. Uh, so we definitely need to change this. Let's work together on that. So optometrists, therapists, interdisciplinary teams, uh, we can identify primitive reflexes, we can provide therapeutic interventions uh, to improve these functional skill outcomes. 
Um, and then these will impact their motor control and cognitive deficits. I mean, that's really the basis behind it. So how can you help? Well, you can use primitive reflex integration techniques to regain some of these vital functions, regardless of what their diagnosis is. But in the context of this meeting and this lecture, obviously we're talking about brain injury. So, um, and we're gonna spend the rest of the morning going through uh, the various reflexes and showing you guys some videos and talking a little bit about uh, some things. So if you haven't seen fainting goats, um, this is kind of an interesting thing here. So. This is actually a f type of fear paralysis. So these are goats are normally, they, this is the way they live. They're, there's nothing wrong with them. Um, well, they some would scared. say there's nothing wrong with them. <laughs> and they faint. Um, and I guess in the old times, farmers used them as the scapegoat. Um, you know, they'd faint when they see something, and then the predators would attack the goat instead of the chickens, I guess. But um, yeah, so fainting goats. You think of a, a motor response to a psychological stimulus. They're scared, and then they freeze and fall over. <laughs> they are kind of cute, aren't they? So, myotonica goats. <laughs> Oh, okay, good. So it is an example of uh, fear paralysis reflex. Another thing is panic attacks. How many of your clients have panic attacks, right? A lot of them. That's where they are. They're, they're at that beginning of the, the bottom of the Jenga tower. They're in that fear paralysis. Uh, so they have irregular breathing and they uh, have severe avoidance. I am not going to go out there because I can't neurologically handle out there. So um, they avoid many things in life. So these are some videos um, of, this one's kind of interesting. He is a police officer, uh, and he's kind of on a break from us for a while while he gets And you can see he's together. got these myoclonic jerks where he'll <gasps> See that? It's like a mini like, panic attack in the breathing system, right? And it's interesting because he'll go into full-blown panic attacks, which I don't, I didn't want to throw that in the video. Nobody wants to see someone suffer like that. Um, but he'll go into full-blown ones and, uh, you know, he has to, what triggers him is uh, flashing lights. But it's interesting because the police force put him back to work. And they always made sure he had a backup with him, but he got hit while he was in the line of duty. And, um, and they put him back out there and they just make sure that on every call they have a second police officer there. They did, they did that because they didn't want to pay and they said, see, he's fine at work. So he can work, so they didn't have to pay for it. But um, eventually they realized this guy is not at all fine. And um, so he's not working anymore, and hopefully he'll be coming back in for services. And then this gentleman, uh, interesting, so you've seen his Romberg test, but now he's just uh, kind of just doing some walking now, and you can just see these like little pieces are, he's actually going into a panic attack now. And again, uh, he did have one in there where he's, he's done. Once you have a panic attack, you can't bring him back. I made a mistake one day. I put on red-green glasses because uh, we were working on um, anti-suppression. And I had him in a well-lit room with the blinds closed, but it was just a lot of natural sunlight, huge windows. And he went on the floor, full sweat, like perspiration. You could wring out his shirt um, from the panic attack that he has. So luckily, he's doing much better now, um, but I thought red-green, they balance each other out. I didn't uh, really think there'd be an issue with that, but there was, so we sometimes learn. So polyvagal theory, how many of you have used poly, or know about the polyvagal theory? Great, how many of you, you actually use the theories in your practice? out of those that are doing, okay. So this is something that we really want to understand. There's some great books out there that I really suggest that you, you look at. These are not um, books for you to give to your family members. There's some good YouTube videos out there that explain it, but the books are pretty technical.